prescribed fire, forest history and its implementation. You're in the right place. Mm -hmm. So the next slide, please. On behalf of my webinar partners, um, we want to thank you very, very much for sharing your evening with us this evening. Uh, my name is Gloria Erickson and I am the Community Wildfire Project Manager for Dovetail Partners Incorporated. And I'm also the St. Louis County FireWise Coordinator. Ashley, our, our poll is still up. Is everyone still seeing the poll instead of our webinar partners? Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh got it. All right. Are we good now? <laughs> oh, I'm still seeing it. Hang on. Okay. All right. <laughs> Let's just start out, where are we? <laughs> where do we live? Um, we are here in uh, Minnesota, um, and we are up in the northeast corner of Minnesota, which is commonly called the Arrowhead region. Um, the town uh, that we, the closest town here that we live in um, is Ely, Minnesota. Uh, the city population is approximately 3,400 people. Um, as you can see uh, on the map to the east, uh, on the right, um, to the east of Ely and north of Ely is the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. Um, but our whole area around here is all gorgeous boreal forest and a multitude of, of freshwater lakes. And in and around all those, all those lakes are residential homes and seasonal homes. And the ownership, the woodland ownership all around uh, Ely is a multiple ownership. We are, as you can see, the Superior National Forest, uh, the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness, uh, which is federal land as well. We have state property, state owned um, property, county, municipal, and of course we have a lot of privately owned forest land. In fact, uh, a big portion of our economy here in Ely really depends on the health of the forest and the water here. Next slide, please. And that forest and the lakes up here is precisely why I moved to Ely 21 years ago. I was all starry-eyed about owning a piece of the dream, living in the woods, living on a lake. Um, and right now I can happily say I am fortunate enough to be there. I am living my dream, but I've realized that with that dream comes a lot of responsibility. And I feel that that responsibility has really become my obligation to help keep my little piece of the property, my forest healthy. And that's actually a big reason why I do what I do. Uh, my job is I actually work with landowners and community members on identifying and helping them implement actions to help them make their forests more healthy and to be more resilient to wildfire. Next slide, please. So in maintaining the health of the forest and being more resilient, it is really a collaborative effort. This is something that cannot be done by one organization or one agency or even an individual. All of us actually have to work together on this. And that's, why, that's how I met the speakers that we have this evening. Um, Lane Johnson is a historical ecologist and geologist and geographer and a member of the Forest Management and Research Group of the University of Minnesota Cloquet Forestry Center. And Timo, Timo Roba is the West Zone Fire Management Officer. He's also a wildland firefighter for the Superior National Forest in Northeast Minnesota. You know, when we first, as Ashley mentioned earlier, when we first began planning this event, it was meant to be an in-person, all-day event, and we were going to go out in the woods. And like everything else, everything changed with COVID. And so it's really has forced us all to adjust our lives and, and how we do things. But unfortunately, wildfire does not acknowledge or even care about COVID. We are seeing and experiencing all over the country, 
all over the world, actually, catastrophic wildfires. And the cost of these wildfires to property, to infrastructure is enormous. But the worst is the loss of the lives and livelihoods of people all over the country. Next slide, please. 2019, the Superior National Forest conducted an assessment of potential losses due to wildfire in the area in and around the Superior National Forest. This is actually a close-up view of that assessment showing the Ely area. And as you can see, Ely is surrounded with red and orange, which means we will suffer huge losses if a wildfire happens here. In fact, next slide please. In 2011, just 13 miles east of Ely in the Boundary Waters area, Canoe Wilderness, a lightning strike started a wildfire. This became one of the biggest fires that we've had in recent history, the Pagami Creek Fire. At the end of that fire, they're burned almost 93,000 acres. For those of you out west, this probably doesn't seem like a lot, but for us, this is huge. And just a year later, on May 2012, an electrical wire came down one mile south of Ely and started a wildfire. At the end of that wildfire, it had burned 175 acres, had knocked out all cell towers, and we had to evacuate half of our town. Next slide, please. So the next slide is a map of the area, of our area here. And it's depicting the different land ownerships that I spoke about earlier. As you can see, the lighter green is the US Forest Service. The darker green is the U.S. Forest Service Wilderness Area, the Boundary Waters Canoe Area. Um, we have other federal lands. The pink is state, the orange is county, and the white is private. And the dots that you see actually represent structures. They represent homes, they represent cabins. And the big mass that you see at the bottom right hand, that's Ely. Now today we're going to be talking about, uh, Timo is going to be talking about an area that the U.S. Forest Service has been working on in that circled area right there. And as you can see, the strategic planning that they, we've been working on in doing prescribed burns and working with landowners, the big emphasis is to try to help contain fire and not sweep through the area where we you see Burnside Lake, Shagwell Lake, and Ely. This is why we do what we do. We are trying to protect people in our areas here besides having healthy forests. I mean, when we look in, at the news every night and we see the blackened faces of the, of the firefighters, both men, men and women, exhausted, from fighting these huge catastrophic fires, a lot of questions come to mind. It's like, how did we get here? What can we do to prepare ourselves and our communities to be more prepared for these wildfires? And really that answer is very multifaceted and it's really gonna take a very big collaborative effort across all boundaries to deal with the situation. I mean, many of us have chosen to live in the woods like I have. Fire will happen here, but we can decide and we can take action and learn how we can live with fire. So part of the preparation includes looking at the over health of our forest land. And as you're journeying with us today, you will see how fire has actually played an important part in shaping and maintaining our fire dependent boreal forests up here. And in looking and learning about the past, we are recognizing and we are developing ways to better manage our present forest health lands and help our forests and communities be more resilient to wildfire. 
So with that, I'd like to start with turning it over to our first speaker, Lane Johnson. You wanna queue up your, your slides there, Lane? Yeah, so it looks like Excellent. everyone can see my screen and my audio is off, so everyone can hear me. Yep, doing good, Lane. Oh, perfect. All right. Good. Great. So, Gloria, thanks for the setup and uh, thanks for everyone for being here. Really uh, cool to be in a virtual environment with you all. You get more people coming from across the country. Um, and thanks to Ashley and Gloria for putting this together. So, um, yeah, I, I'm a research forester with the University of Minnesota Hope Cave Forestry Center. Um, classically trained as a geographer and uh, my bread and butter is really tree ring research and I use tree rings to better understand the history of uh, fire in our forests in the Great Lakes region and I've also been able to work in the southwest a little bit. So the photo here is uh, this, you know, we all have um, big fish stories um, or uh, many of us have big fish stories in Minnesota. So uh, for me, um, I tend to show people pictures of old trees and, and uh, old wood. So here's one prize piece from uh, Northern New Mexico, 2016. And these types of fire scarred specimens are what I oftentimes uh, am gravitating to when I'm interested in um, the history of forested sites in the Great Lakes region. So I'm with the Cloquet Forest Center, which is the primary research and teaching forest for the University of Minnesota. We've been located um, three minutes south of Duluth on the Fond du Lac Reservation since uh, 1910. And we're one of uh, 10 research and outreach centers located across the state connected with the College of Food, Ag, and Natural Resource Sciences. And essentially our mission at the Cloquet Forestry Center is to um, connect people and ideas to build understanding of northern forest ecosystems. And so that's why I agreed to be here tonight with you all. When we're talking about fire in northern Minnesota, I mean what we're covering over the next 30 minutes is really a really short ecological history. There's so much to really talk about and we're just gonna, this is really broad brush. Um, but it's worth noting that uh, we have history of really large catastrophic fires in our past in the Great Lakes region. The second deadliest fire in US history, the Cloquet Moose Lake Fire, 1918, pictured here. Um, and then the Hinkley uh, Fire that occurred in 1894, third deadliest. And next year is going to be the 150th anniversary of the Peshigo Fire that occurred in 1871 in Wisconsin and killed a uh, thousand plus people, burned a large area. Uh, so the area of interest tonight is really the Arrowhead region of, of um, Northeast Minnesota. I'll be talking about data sets and information from the Superior National Forest and specifically the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness, um, Voyager's National Park, but I'll also be pulling um, from some information from where I work in Cloquet down uh, just southwest of Duluth. But this is relevant, this information is relevant to uh, pretty much all of the Western Great Lakes region where we have pine forest. It's worth mentioning, uh, you know, nationally, we're in a situation where the West is burning again. And we have uh, fires from Southern California all the way up into Washington state, um, producing tons of smoke. Some of us experience impacts um, or, you know, uh, foggy, hazy mornings here in Minnesota because of those fires. Um, since the, the 80s or 90s, we've really seen uh, a rise in uh, acres burned per year. And uh, the, both the number of wildfires, um, but also uh, an increase in fire size. And it seems like every year we kind of wonder if we're gonna be uh, set a record with spending. Um, 2018 was a pretty, pretty really impressive year where we spent $3.1 billion uh, on fire suppression just uh, by, the, by the US Forest Service and the Department of Interior. It doesn't even account for state spending. Um, so uh, this kind of information leads me to suggest that this, um, this approach to fire suppression, uh, the smoky bear sort of um, ideals, uh, haven't 
um, they're not working for us anymore and we need to find an alternative option. Uh, 2020 so far, we've got over 44,000 fires, uh, close to 7.5 million acres burned, and the, the year's not over yet. Um, and we're 1.3 million acres above the 10 year average right now. And um, that area is growing um, as we speak. Uh, explanations for our impressive fire year and, um, you know, uh, why the West is burning from, from year to year routinely. Um, it's a uh, hundred years of fire suppression. We have tons of uh, accumulated fuels. Um, climate change, we've got this, what I like to call global weirding, where we've got, you know, early snow melts um, in the West. Uh, we've got extended fire seasons, uh, drought, and um, that kind of makes fuel av available to burn and burn more vigorously. And then also we have increased uh, development, um, people living, choosing to live in wildfire prone settings, what, what we typically refer to as the, the wildland urban interface. And, you know, this isn't, these aren't things that are uh, factors just out West. These are factors nationally um, and are particularly relevant here in the Great Lakes and Northern Minnesota. So uh, we don't have crazy fire years, uh, fortunately, in the lake states um, very frequently, but occasionally we get, we get surprised. And so when I was living um, in northern Wisconsin, working for the U.S. Park Service um, out of Bayfield, the German Road fire occurred uh, May 2013. And it was a small fire by, um, by most standards, 7,500 acres, um, but it destroyed 104 structures and threatened a bunch of other homes, um, both year round and seasonal residents and um, really caught people, people off guard. And then of course, what Gloria mentioned, there's the Bakami Creek fire that occurred uh, east of Ely in the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness and actually burned out of the wilderness on the south end uh, at 93,000 acres. You can basically see how uh, large this fire footprint is relative to the size of Ely. And um, it's also worth noting that the, a large majority of that burned acreage um, occurred in really like one, um, one day. It's uh, suggestive of the, the volatility of the fuels in, in the Great Lakes region um, when you know, conditions are right. So we know that the Pagami Creek fire um, is within the historical range of variation. Uh, we've seen larger fires in uh, northern Minnesota prior to the Pagami Creek fire. We know this because of the, the pioneering fire, fire ecology work of a researcher named Myron Heinzelman, who worked for the Forest Service. Um, and in the 60s and 70s, he did some really impressive work across the million acre Boundary Waters canoe area. Um, basically looking at the history of fire in that landscape. And he used uh, collections of aerial photographs in from uh, 1948 and uh, basically used aerial photo interpretation to map out fire origin patches of forests across the wilderness and was able to use um, by going out into the field and visiting these sites and collecting tree ring information, both um, cores from living trees, but also uh, cross sections from fire scarred pine and other species. He's able to assign um, fire years to these different forest patches. So you can see here, um, there's areas that burned in 1863 and 64, um, areas that burned in 1894, uh, 1712, 1900. So this is an area of the Boundary Waters Wilderness just west of um, west of Burntside Lake and um, west of the project area we'll be visiting with Timo later tonight. And what uh, Heinzelman's research illustrated is that um, the Boundary Waters canoe area it was, is um, a fire maintained mosaic and it was a, a mixture of different forest age classes and, um, and forest types based on the frequency of fire and uh, the intensity of that fire as well as you know landforms and other things. And so the data that he collected, um, these stand origin maps 
he used um, and compiled these fire year maps for the wilderness. And basically, you can see um, events like the 1863-64 fire, uh, fire years burned large portions of um, the Boundary Waters Canoe Area, which is this, uh, has this green outline. And um, though he didn't, he didn't study areas outside of the wilderness, we know that the 1863-64 fire year burned uh, in other parts of the Arrowhead because of tree ring evidence, including where I work now, in Cloquet. So uh, we have potential for big fires uh, in this landscape. And uh, Heinzelman's 1973 research paper, uh, he starts out with something that's so eloquent, I wanna just read it to you all. Um, I feel like it's very descriptive and kind of poetic. Uh, he wrote that fire largely determined the composition and structure of the pre-settlement vegetation as well as the vegetation mosaic on the landscape and the habitat patterns for wildlife. It also influenced nutrient cycles and energy pathways and helped maintain the diversity, productivity, and long-term stability of the ecosystem. Thus, the whole ecosystem was fire dependent. And so we talk a lot about fire dependent forests and my, uh, my work and people often say, well, what does it mean for when we talk about a fire dependent forest. And essentially, it's uh, you know, any forest type that is, uh, that is uh, perpetuated by fire and that the fires modify the soil, light, nutrient conditions to allow for, for forest regeneration. And the MESODNR typically refers to these um, fire dependent forest types as native plant communities and they can be either forests or woodlands depending on um, the frequency of fire and the density of trees. So of our fire dependent species in the Great Lakes region in Minnesota, I, I think that red pine is one of our most fire dependent. Um, you know, there's oaks, jack pine, some classics, but uh, I believe that red pine is particularly finicky in its fire dependence and that it relies on frequent fire to successfully regenerate or to, um, for, um, to be maintained at a site, but then we need like mixed severity fire uh, or a patchy um, fire that can open up the canopy and uh, allow for, uh, create space within a site for new trees to come in and, um, and establish. So uh, this kind of finickiness that red pine has with fire, uh, it needs, you know, the Goldilocks principle of not too much and not too little, just the right amount is why I ended up studying um, tree ring fire history in red pine in the Boundary Waters about 10 years ago. So here, here we are now uh, talking a bit about it <laughs> in the COVID era. But um, so the, the types of tree ring records we're working with in uh, red pine sites are uh, shown here. Uh, uh, a research technician I worked with, Ben Mathis, is inspecting this remnant red pine that has a cat face at the base, has a record of quite a few fires, and it was wind thrown in the, in the late 80s. And we come across these and we're able to uh, take samples with a crosscut saw or handsaw and bring them back to the lab and polish them up. And the particular tree that Ben is um, kneeling next to here is um, pictured in this next slide. We're able to surface them and with the science of dendrochronology, uh, basically true ring dating, we're able to use the patterns of wide narrow rings to assign um, fire years to these different events uh, that you see here. And so this particular red pine located on an, in an island on Lake Saganega in the Boundary Waters area, west of the Gunflint Trail, began growing in the, the 1600s and died in 1989 and um, survived 10 uh, non-lethal fires from 1702 to 1850. And when we take records from, you know, a number of different trees and bring them all together, uh, it really tells a compelling story for Water Lakes landscape. So here's um, a collection of records from 656 trees located both within the Boundary Waters Canoe Area in Voyagers National Park, 
and that blue arrow there is pointing to what I believe is the one sample collected from um, Voyager's Island that I showed in the last slide. And um, every single horizontal line that you see on this fire chart is representing the life um, of a single pine tree, red pine tree. And every single um, red triangle is representing a fire event that that um, tree recorded over its life. Um, so there's a lot of information that we can drive from these types of fire charts related to, to fire frequency, um, kind of fire synchrony, so like events where we have fire occurring across large areas. So when we mash things together across, um, you know, the broader landscape, we see that there's some, um, some fire years that occur over large areas, so like in the 1860s. Um, but uh, 1739 is another example. But uh, one of the things that I guess I want to point out is both uh, kind of when the, uh, the onset of frequent fire, which is in 1736, and also when fires stop, which is around 1910. So uh, Kurt Kiffmuller, who's a colleague of mine, uh, my former master's advisor, he um, pulled out a fun stat that between the year 1736 and 1900, there were 156 uh, fire years out of a possible 164. So 95% of the fire years between 1736 and 1900, we were able to pick up a fire event somewhere in this landscape. And it's likely that if we continued to sample trees across the landscape, eventually we would have a fire occurring every single one of those years. So it's really suggestive of uh, a really rich fire history and that um, the work of Heinzelman suggesting we had these really large fire events semi-frequently and then this tree ring work um, that we have here suggests that within those large high severity fire patches there was um, really frequent low severity fire that was also occurring um, at more frequent um, uh, time scales. And then with the onset of um, federal uh, management, uh, the, the formation of the Superior National Forest, we see this pretty abrupt decline in fire occurrence uh, following 1910. So places in the Boundary Waters like the Dahlgren River Portage, pictured here, this is a photo from 1920. The guy kind of hanging out uh, below this red pine on the right is Ranger Dahlgren, who uh, is the namesake for the, <laughs> the portage. Um, uh, this is kind of shows what uh, these areas looked like that were fire maintained, a red pine woodland essentially that last burned in 1894. And we revisited this site to, to collect fire history data in uh, 2015. And this is what um, that site looks like today. So we've got some young, well, we've got a cohort of old pine that are still there from the 1730s. Uh, and then we've got uh, younger red pine that came in with the onset of fire exclusion uh, around 1900. And then we've got a bunch of um, balsam fir and other types of evergreen uh, trees, spruce coming in in the understory. And the question um, that often comes to mind for me is we're thinking about these sites, not just as kind of pretty forested settings, but um, as fuels. Well, what's the probability of these really large old growth pine um, and surviving the next big fire that comes through. And I think um, the answer is that uh, they don't have a good chance given the current, um, situa the current fuel situation. So uh, looking at Northern Minnesota, we've got uh, a map here that basically maps the, the native plant communities or the model native plant communities of uh, northern Minnesota. So you can see the arrowhead here and um, the entire area that's shown is red is this fire dependent, these different fire dependent forest types or woodland types, um, a lot of which are, are uh, pine um, systems or pine and oak systems as we move further west. And you can see this little red spot down here is where I work in Cloquet. And you can see that uh, the area around Ely is pretty much all mapped as fire dependent forests. 
We're taking you to the Cloquet Forestry Center. This is a photo that was taken in 1911 of a fire dependent forest type, um, a red pine, jack pine uh, woodland essentially. And I love this photo because it basically shows an area of the forestry center that we can still visit today that uh, um, has largely been left intact and hasn't been modified heavily um, by forest management other than that it's been set aside as a reserve. But uh, in the 1920s, uh, U of M Forester described the, the stand pictured here and he wrote that uh, there's very little underbrush present. The ground cover consists pr principally of blueberry, sweet fern, honeysuckle, and wintergreen. Um, and went, goes on to say that uh, as is typical of this region, the stand has been subjected to a number of fires so that all the trees are more or less cat-faced. These scars show three fires all coming from the same direction. While these fires doubtless have had some effect on the rate of growth, it must be remembered that it is common to all stands of like age in this region. And I love that, it basically saying that this is a pretty normal forest condition or woodland condition for uh, red pine sites across um, the Western Lake States, essentially. So we can take tree and records from sites like this at the Cloquet Forestry Center, and we can uh, basically uh, assess them and figure out that these stands, uh, or this particular stand, uh, developed in the 1820s and experienced a number of fires over um, the life of these trees. Uh, so 1841, 55, 64, similar to the 1863, 64 year up in the Border Lakes, 1871, 1881, and these fires continue until uh, the last fire in 1908, which is one year before the University of Minnesota acquired the property and began to um, you know, pretty extensive efforts to keep fire out of this landscape. And uh, what we're beginning to really more fully understand today is that a lot of these areas where we're developing fire history records, um, records of frequent surface fire were also um, areas that were um, home to um, Border Lakes Ojibwe or other um, other cultural groups prior to Euro-American settlement. So uh, it's interesting or worth noting that uh, the human, there's quite possibly a human imprint um, on the fire uh, histories that we're developing in red pine stands across uh, northeastern Minnesota. And I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit more later. So around 1900, uh, in Minnesota and elsewhere, there was really, you know, heavy-handed effort to um, exclude fire from our forest lands. So this is a photo that was taken in 1910 in the Boundary Waters Canoe Area, um, it was, or the Superior National Forest, rather, in 1910. And you can see that it's posted that there's a $5,000 fine um, or uh, imprisonment for two years or both for setting fire maliciously, or a fine of $1,000 or imprisonment for one year or both if um, fires result from carelessness. So if we adjust um, $5,000 for inflation, uh, today that's a, like $131,000 fine for uh, you know, an arson fire, and $1,000 would be around 26, $26,000. Um, <laughs> so they, they were really trying to make a point that didn't want fire occurring in these landscapes um, and that you could be fined or jailed for, for being careless. Um, so it's a kind of a complicated topic and maybe that's why I'm being a little clunky with um, what I'm trying to say, but uh, we have a new paper out came out this uh, this summer. It's open source. You can check it out. It's called People, Fire, and Pine. If you just Google that, it should show up. But basically, it, we are working to explain uh, our reasoning around this. But we're talking about um, old growth pine, young pine, 
culturally modified pine, fire, and the relationship of all those things um, to, to people and place. So check it out, people, fire, and pine. Um, so yeah, I mentioned earlier, uh, Minnesota, we have a history of really large catastrophic fires. Hinkley Fire in 1894 killed um, you know, over 430 people. And uh, the, the fire suppression efforts that began in Minnesota and elsewhere in the Great Lakes region in uh, around 1910 wasn't just about protecting lives and property, it was about protecting timber and um, future timber assets. You have to remember that the entire Lake States region was heavily cut over and deforested and, and burned. And uh, there's, you know, particular interest in uh, protecting the forests of the future. So sites like this at the Cloquet Forestry Center, you know, had really young pine in the, in the 20s and 30s. And um, with the absence of fire, we've we have mature forests today that um, many of us are familiar with. And the reality is that um, we don't need to be so concerned about losing large swaths of our forests to, to fire um, because we, we have a lot of mature forest over the landscape and across the landscape. In fact, I would say that we have um, our, our forests are overly treed and are overly dense. And what we need now with 100 years of fire suppression is to return to this fire maintained forest mosaic. So here's a photo from Burnt Side Lake, uh, circa 1900. And you can see here that you have a mix of forest densities across um, these different islands and in the foreground. You can see, you know, closed forest and more open forest and Kind of uh, like little barren patches or forest openings, and uh, this is really what um, what this landscape should probably look like. It should not be a, th uh, a thick wall of fir, um, pine, and other species. And I want to call out that you know a photo taken from a similar vantage point as the last one. If you zoom in onto the island we were looking at earlier, you can see on the west end that there's uh, a teepee frame. And uh, again, I wanna emphasize that, that these fire maintained landscapes, they, they, weren't, um, they weren't pristine uh, environments. They were, um, they were home to uh, indigenous communities before Euro-American settlement. And these, um, these indigenous communities had uh, um, a strong knowledge of fire and we're using fire to their benefit uh, to meet their subsistence needs and in a lot of ways they were working and manipulating the landscape to protect themselves from catastrophic fire as well. So the, the Border Lakes Ojibwe and other um, Anishinaabe communities in the Great Lakes region were really the, the first uh, or the original fire adapted communities. So for example, here's a, a habitation site on Washington Island, Basswood Lake uh, in the Boundary Waters Canoe area, 1899. This is uh, an area that was not harvested um, by timber companies until um, 1900 to 1912. So an anthropologist got in here, took some photos before um, the logging companies got in. You can see how um, sparsely forested this island setting is. And it happens to be that this a uh, portion of Basswood Lake, there were um, gardens on Washington Island that likely um, uh, were put in place after clearing fires had been set. And basically it opened up this entire area. Um, you can imagine if you're living in a place like a boreal forest, you might not want to be surrounded by dense forests. You might want to have an open view shed um, to get winds and to have bugs um, blown away and that you would also want to be able to see people coming across the water so you could uh, go out to meet them or flag them over if you wanted to, to trade or exchange information. So there's a lot of strategic value in having these open um, fire maintained sites and ultimately this looks like a lot less threatening of a setting to have a birch bark home uh, 
set up in rather than uh, you know, more densely forest in site. So if we're talking about kind of human or indigenous um, manipulation of landscape to meet subsistence needs, I want to just um, pull out two examples of kind of the abundance of fire maintained landscapes. So uh, northwest of Ely in 1909, there was uh, a man named Leslie Beatty who was just maybe a boy that uh, was accompanying a uh, National Geographic photographer on a trip up the uh, Ninamoose River. And he remembers, recalled in uh, a 1962 article about the time he uh, was paddling between uh, Agnes and Ninamoose Lakes one afternoon and he counted 57 moose in the water. And I mean, I don't know about you all, but um, I've spent a fair bit spent a fair bit of time paddling in northern Minnesota and I feel really fortunate if I can see you know one or two moose on a trip let alone 57 and it just so happens that this area had burned in the 1860s and 1894 and 1904 and had really prime habitat for large ungulates like moose that need young forest as browse and if you ask um, you know a wildlife biologist that uh, is studying moose in northern Minnesota in the present day, they'll tell you um, if you wanna find moose or uh, if you wanna identify uh, an area where moose populations are doing well, you need to go to recently burned areas like um, the Ham Lake, Cavity Lake fires um, up the Gunflint Trail. And in the future, Pagani, uh, the Pagani Creek footprint will be good moose habitat as well. So another uh, example, uh, a little bit further away from the Ely area, Kenora, Ontario. Uh, this is from the Rat Portage Miner and Semi-Weekly News uh, in 1901, where they reported uh, 160 tons of Lake of the Woods blueberries were shipped by railway to markets. And there were revenues in present day values of uh, $700,000 um, for uh, oh. those blueberry sales. And um, most interestingly, this area, uh, you know, only a quarter of the crop was harvested because of the limited availability of pickers. So this like a, abundance of blueberries is really, um, I think strongly linked to the history of fire in this landscape, considering that fire or blueberries are a fire dependent species as well. And uh, I happens that in the 1820s, this area was visited by um, a surveyor that was hired by the US government to survey the international border in the 1820s. And he, he reported that the same area um, in the 1820s was frequented by Ojibwe blueberry pickers and that they were intentionally, intentionally burning areas of high ground near uh, present day Kenora um, to promote or basically keep um, these upland sites open, most likely for blueberries. So I, there's people that I do fire history research with or other people that do fire history that I, I uh, am able to connect with. And it's just always interesting to think about the magnitude of forest change that's occurred over time uh, in the Great Lakes region and elsewhere. And um, it's really hard to describe <laughs> what's going on and why we aren't able to fully understand that magnitude of change. And we sometimes kind of refer to it as ecological amnesia or ecological dementia. But in the, the academic literature, there's this, um, this term for it called the shifting baseline syndrome or SBS. And I think it's particularly appropriate when we're talking about understanding uh, fire history and forest change in the lake states or the Great Lakes region. And it's this socio-physiological phenomenon, sorry, psychological phenomenon in which historical environmental information is lost over time and people do not notice changes in biological systems. It's this, this uh, persistent downgrading of perceived normal environmental conditions across generations leading to an underestimate of the true magnitude of long-term environmental change. So when we 
come to forested sites like um, this reserve stand at the Cloquet Forestry Center, we can see what it looked like in 1928 because we've got this long-term record management. You can see that there's, you know, fire, fire charred bases of trees. And if we fast forward to the present day, this is the same, this is the same site and it looks remarkably different. We've got tons of balsam in the understory. You uh, wouldn't necessarily want to step off trail and walk through this if you didn't have to. And this is what a lot of our red pine sites across the lake states look like. They've got thick um, balsam understories. Uh, they're more uh, closed forests than they are open woodlands. And the diversity of flora in the understory is greatly diminished. Uh, a lot of places where we don't have uh, thick balsam, we have uh, these uh, thickets of beaked hazel that we can um, swim through, essentially. We call them, in some cases, re recalcitrant shrub layers. And uh, some of the best ways to control these hazel understories is uh, with prescribed fire. Um, but you can think that uh, conditions like this don't have the same type of um, ecological or um, recreational aesthetic value as some of these fire maintained um, settings that, um, that we could have. So at uh, the Forestry Center, the site that I've been kind of highlighting is called the Camp 8 Stand. Uh, because we're short on time, if you want to check out a little bit more about the history of the site um, or what our future plans are for this area, uh, there's a story map available online. You can go to z.umn.edu slash camp8. And um, it's a pretty inter compelling interactive piece that I think many of you may enjoy seeing. But we're hoping to be burning at the Camp 8 stand and elsewhere at the Forestry Center um, spring of next year, possibly as early as, um, as uh, next week if, um, if things dry out. And, you know, when it comes to prescribed fire, you know, thinking beyond fuels reduction for public safety, there's all these ecological, economic, aesthetic, and traditional cultural reasons to reintroduce fire to our fire dependent forests and woodlands. And at the Forestry Center, um, as a research and teaching forest, we have areas where people can have immersed, or we need to have areas where we can have people um, basically have these immersive learning experiences in fire maintained settings. And so our main goal, Forestry Center, to return fire as a critical ecological process. Um, to achieve cross-cultural objectives within a portion of our fire-dependent land base. And we really wanna provide opportunities for people to, to see and smell and taste and, and feel and fully experience the benefits of um, prescribed fire and fire-maintained sites. And ultimately, this is how we can get, I think this is how we can get people excited to become excited about fire and to get them to become vocal advocates of prescribed fire across ownership types. And so uh, hopefully that's a nice um, setup for the next portion of, um, of our time together where we're visiting a site with Timo. So thanks everybody. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or uh, uh, colleagues that I've been working with, Evan Larson, Kurt Kipfmuller um, with the U of M. Twin Cities or University of Wisconsin, Blackville. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Lang. I'll turn it back over to Gloria to introduce our next speaker while I get the presentation queued up. Lang, that was fantastic. Thank you very, very much. Um, and the next uh, portion of our um, webinar, we will be taking a walk in the woods with Timo Rova um, and You'll see and Timo will talk about what the U.S. Forest Service is doing in the Superior National Forest in using prescribed fire for our forest, depend our 
dependent forest on fire. So here we go. My name is Timo Rova. I'm uh, the West Zone FMO, which is fire management officer. I, uh, the West Zone is the Ely Kwishwe office, the Aurora Laurentian and the Cook LaCroix offices. It uh, encompasses the western two-thirds of the Superior National Forest in the wilderness. Uh, I'm a native Minnesotan. I lived away for over two decades working for the Forest Service out west, but I'm back and my family's from Ely. When they came over from Finland, this is where they came, homesteaded, worked the mines, the logging camps, the co-ops, all of that. And so I have a history here. And uh, this is where I live now is within about five miles of where we stand right now. Right now we're on Burnside Lake. We're on a bay called School Section Bay. It's Section 16 a school section, a state owned, and we're right now coming off of that onto section 17, which is Forest Service owned, on the west shore of Burnside Lake, just below the North Arm uh, Channel, where Camp Widgee and Denord are, and just north of the portage to Crab Lake, into the wilderness. The wilderness is a little over a quarter of a mile to our west. Well, our stems per acre, the density of trees has gone way up. And so there's been more shading. And with more shading and encroachment into our blueberry meadows, which are bigger and more sunny, uh, we've got an encroachment with uh, mainly balsam. Without fire, it had, it had encroached in a lot of these openings. And under, in the understory of the bigger pine, it was coming up and would have been a ladder fuel that when it burned, it would have carried it up into the canopy of the, the super pine and the, the old story pine, the seed source for the future. And um, a lot of shading, a lot of diversity was lost with uh, the absence of fire. Blueberries were not producing blueberries. They were going dormant. They need fire to prune them. Uh, we had a lot of maple coming in and uh, that's a global change species too, so that was coming in. And we were losing our, our birch. We didn't have much or any new birch coming up. And, uh, and we were losing our jack pine also. In some areas we've lost it. Our forest plan, you know, fire is a natural agent of change on all the forest. But in the wilderness, it's uh, one of the main ones we have, and we have it written in there, written in the forest plan that we can use fire and manage it. We don't let it go. We don't let it burn. We manage a fire with a plan to act like a fire historically would. Uh, so if we get a lightning strike in the wilderness and the timing's right, we can get permission to allow that fire to burn. And we set up a box, like we'd like to allow it to have a chance to grow out to these lakes, this river, these natural boundaries, we call them. And now under a current um, policy, we can even go in and do some manipulation, like on a portage or something to help hold it there. In the past, we couldn't. Now we can we can manage the fire and do a little bit of work in certain areas to use reinforce the natural boundary or a portage to to limit the growth to a certain area. But the the big problem with managing fire in the wilderness is when the fire comes out of the wilderness. And in this area, people have developed on their private land a lot of infrastructure right on the edge of the wilderness. And this treatment is right on the eastern edge of the trout unit of the wilderness, of the Boundary Waters Wilderness Canoe Area. So by doing this treatment, the hope is it will give us some ground to work from, some areas and acres that are treated right on the edge of the wilderness to help us deal with a fire that's coming to come out of the wilderness and impact private land. And... Uh, thus 
it's for public safety. So we can manage fires in the wilderness in the future and get that back more in a natural functioning ecosystem. So one of the objectives of the reintroduction of fire on this part of Burnside Lake and hopefully to a greater part of the Superior Forest is that uh, we can keep it a fire dependent ecosystem. With the suppression we had for over a hundred years, balsam encroached and came in, was ubiquitous across this whole landscape. There was very little area without balsam. And then we have the spruce budworm come in and kill it. And it's very susceptible to fire. And um, there was no mosaic. There was no break in that. It was all a decadent forest with a lot of dead and dying balsam very heavily stocked, which is a firefighter's nightmare. It also isn't how this forest and this area had ever been in the past. There had been frequent fly fires that kept it more of a mosaic and different age classes and broke up the density and the availability of the balsam. And this area here was burnt the first time in mid-June of 2015. It was reburned last year, 2019, in late May. So this area has been burned twice. Uh, when we first burned it, we, we went on a wetter, a cooler end of the prescription. Prescription is what allows us to burn. We are within certain parameters and we, we put those out for the public and other folks to know what they are. And we wait for the weather and the fuels to be within that prescription. After our first burn, we could burn it hotter because we had taken the flash, the, um, the flashiness of the balsam and that mostly out of the burn. So the second time we burned it, just last year in 2019, we burned it under a hotter prescription. And with that, we were able to get some consumption of the heavies, of the soils, and the fire carried into areas it hadn't the first time because they were more available to burn. The first time that we burned it, before we did that, we did some mechanical work, hand treatment, timber stand improvement, we call TSI. And in that area, we didn't have enough money to do all of it, so we went in using a tool LIDAR, we call LIDAR, and um, we found these stands of pine. And, and um, we built polygons, which are like closed units, and we, we made them the size of the money we had to do treatment. So they, we were given so much money from the regional office and the WO, Washington office, to do this project, and we were, figured out how much it was going to cost per acre to have crews come in and cut this and TSI it. And so we made them, and we... we we concentrated on the stands of pine, thinking that's what we wanted to protect the most. And so they came in, they cut all balsam six inches or four inches and smaller, and cut it four feet or less, cut ma young maple and uh, any di dead or dying birch, laid it on the ground, and when it was under the pines, they pulled it away from the boles of the trees to try minimizing um, severity of the burn in the pine stands. This is an area that shows the mixed severity of burn. It shows some more severeness even. Uh, we killed some of the big white and red pine. Uh, all the birch is dead, but if you look at the stump of every birch, there's new baby birch coming up. And they're coming up. We're going to have a whole new crop and the mineral soil has been opened up, they'll within a few years be able to seed in. We're going to see a lot more birch, which we've been losing. Um, we killed some of the pine, and that does alarm people, but what people may not realize in our thick forests, like we're going to see later on, a lot of these pine are dying and falling over. We just don't see it. The brush is so thick, and there's so much balsam. Well, here, they died standing, they're fire hardened. Some of them are gonna stay standing for a long time and that's great for a wildlife tree, for bald eagle, osprey, and all sorts of uh, birds. This is what we need. 
but you can see a lot of them made it. A lot of very beautiful ones made it, and they're going to help seed in and start a new crop. And we have some, a lot of diversity here. We have a few aspen. We have birch. We have it open. We have some maple stump sprouting and coming up. We're getting young white and red pine coming in here, and we have a lot of blueberry. And this is going to change, and if we could burn it again in like 20 to 30 years, once the pine, like the ones over here, you can see these young pine over here that are about 15 years old, they made it through this prescribed fire where other things didn't. Pine can handle fire very, very well. So if we could burn it in 20 to 30 years again, a lot of the pine that would be coming up would make it. Some wouldn't, and that's great. That keeps openings and patchiness and mosaic. But um, this is really going to help, and it's, it's quite open. We can, we can get a breeze through here. It's not stifled and choked. And uh, this is what we want. And it may look severe to people, but it really isn't. Severe to a lot of us is all the dead, thick balsam. We were looking for a good project. Uh, we hadn't been burning on the west zone for quite a while. We had just come out of the Pagami burn, the Pagami fire which showed that uh, managing fires is tough, but it also showed us that fires want to burn big in this country, especially with uh, 100 plus years of suppression. We have the ham, the cavity, Sag Corridor, um, the Gabros, the Pagami. We have uh, the White Feather. All these fires and more, there's the Little Indian Sioux, where we see that fires want to go big quick. The area goes from not able to hardly burn at all to being able to sustain large fire pretty quickly. Uh, we can go from the lowest indices to very high in seven days and to extreme in like 12 to 13 days. That's, that's less than two weeks from sopping wet to having fire, campfire restrictions and, and that kind of stuff. So especially with all the balsam, we're really susceptible. Um, having not done much prescribed burn for a while, we had been doing quite a bit after the blowdown, but had kind of fallen out of it. Uh, we needed to get back into it. And we're looking at this area, we had just had a fire in the wilderness and when I first got here in late 2012, and the smoke was laying right over in this area, and people were concerned about it. And for a fire in the wilderness to come out or to be managed in there and feel a little more comfortable with it, I felt like this area along Burnside, a premier lake in northern Minnesota, would be a good candidate to focus our work as we rebuilt the program. We got confidence after some very big fires that kind of shook our confidence. And it was a good candidate because it was really protecting communities, uh, the communities on Burnside, but even the community itself of Ely, because that's not too far away. And these, I came in, I also would walk around and I, grew up on this lake, coming to this lake, my family's from here, um, and I go with my grandpa and my dad and mom across the lake over to this side to go blueberry picking, to go hunting, and there weren't berries to pick anymore. There wasn't much game to shoot. It was hard to walk through the woods because there was just thick and tons of blowdown and deadfall, and um, it didn't have the big openings and the nice rocky ridges like I remembered as a kid and that my grandpa talked about. My grandpa said when he was young that the natives he knew would paddle along here and burn off the shorelines. And when, when they were asked why, they said the lake's called Burntside, you know. And so I grew up with these stories and, and, and hunting and gathering and just recreating uh, on this lake and in this area and up the echo. And it had changed so much in my two plus decades out west that to me, I had a memory and when I came back it was so different. Maybe if you live here and it happens slowly, you don't realize it's changed that much. The Coo Lake area, we've been doing uh, mechanical treatment with TSI, which is timber stand improvement. Hand saw crews come in, they had to boat in here because this is a remote location, and we pay them per acre to cut and 
lop and scatter, we call it this. Sometimes we have them hand cut and pile, and that's much more expensive. Um, sometimes we think, oh, it would be great to have hand cut and piled this, but if you see how much there is, you look in here, the slash is three to five feet deep across almost all of this unit. And this is 220 some acre unit. It butts right up to the wilderness. There's private property and county land with lease cabins on it right on the edge of it too. This is all balsam that was cut. It's been hit by spruce budworm. It was all gonna die. Our big challenge right now is how do we burn this and still keep something around? You know, how do we retain? Now there's a lot of jack pine that with it burning hot, we'll kill some of it, some we won't, but the cones will open up and this will be really good for reestablishing a jack pine stand in this area. It'll be predominantly jack pine and birch, I hope, because that's where it looks. We're up on some of the rocky knobs, we'll still retain some really good white and red pine that'll help seed in. Um, but you know, the question is, how do we burn this when there's so much fuel on the ground? What you see is everywhere out there, except for on the top of the ridges and it is thick and it's gonna burn hot. We could wait three years, let the needles fall off and snow compact it, it might go better. We could burn it when it's really wet the first time and uh, you know fairly wet and then have to go back in two to three years later and burn it again to, to knock back the hardwood. But all that aside, when I put on the suppression part of my FMO hat, I breathe a sigh of relief because this stuff isn't standing up anymore. It's not up, carrying the fire up into the canopies. It's down on the ground, and sure, it'll burn hot, but our spotting issue is gonna go far, far away. We could have some spotting, but uh, we aren't gonna have nearly as much. It would be hard to put a fire out once it got well established in here, but we can back off and burn off the lake and the edge of the unit. So we've already done a lot in mitigating the fire hazard in this area by just knocking this balsam over. Um, so step one has been done and people can feel a little better about that. Once we get this stuff burned up, they can feel a lot better. When a fire would be coming from an untreated area and hits this treatment area, and this is a large enough area that uh, just the size of it, 220 acres, gives it the depth and the breadth that it's a more resilient treatment. The fire is going to go from running through the crowns and torching and spotting into this stuff. And this stuff, since it's been laid down and cut, and even if it's been given nine months in a snow to compact it down, is going to burn much less fast, still burn hot but it won't be burning and moving as fast and it won't be spreading by spotting as much as if it was upstanding. So it's easier to fight, it's easier to contain and our fire behavior is great. And now the wilderness right over there can hopefully start having some more fires in it that we can manage and they can do it appropriately without taking off and running because we got this this area ready to hold it and if we get a gobbler in there when it hits here we have a good place that firefighters are safe to engage it from and it, it, it builds an area that we can pick it up before it gets into the public's private owned land and places. So all in all, it's a really good strategy. Um, there are some hard parts and lighting the first matches after it hasn't had fire for a hundred years is, is a really tough thing to do. It's really tough to convince people to let you do it and then day of and the day before is really tough. And you don't sleep much the night before but someone has to do it because it's not a question of if, it's just a question of when is this going to burn. And this is very beautiful. Thank you, Timo. Is there anything you'd like to add? 
Timo, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Um, I'm just turning things off. Oh. Um, <laughs> no, um, no, thanks for uh, taking uh, the time to put this together. I think uh, it says a lot there. Lane was able to point out how the indigenous use of the land included fire and you know we had lightning strikes and now we're talking about what it needs to get back and the challenges and so i think it went well i'm ready for questions or to talk about stuff or whatever perfect so let's go ahead and open it up for q a we still have um some time here at the end and you can either unmute yourself and ask your question directly, or you can drop any questions you might have in the chat pod. So as we did earlier in the session where we start sharing what location we're joining from tonight, you can likewise drop questions in there and I can pass them on to the presenters. So um, with that, I'll open it up. Anyone have questions for Timo, Gloria, or Lane? Timo, this is Gloria. I want to know what a gobbler is. <laughs> Big fire that's going great guns and get out of the way because uh, it's just gobbling up the woods. It's, it's uh, take, taking a walk. <clears throat> so I've got a question here and actually two questions just came in related to the TSI work that was done, Timo. And so one question was, what does it cost for TSI to limit your fuels? And then another one was, looking at the cost per acre for the TSI for that balsam. So I think probably those two questions are getting probably at the same thing. Um, well, it, it's changing all the time. Right now, costs are going quite a bit higher because a lot of our, uh, it's done by our fire crews and it's also done by our contractors, people that uh, sign up and uh, bid. And we tend to go to lowest, lowest bidder, but not always. Sometimes they prove they're too low and can't do it. So we go up a level. Um, it's the availability of people that can do that kind of work and the number of contractors. So it's just like anything, working on your house or anything like that. They just, um, it can be between 350 bucks an acre up to about 1500 bucks an acre with piling in there. Our prices are going up. Uh, some of our contractors that bid pretty low just decided it wasn't worth it and didn't show up. So it's, I'd say about 500 to seven, you know, 500, 600 bucks an acre currently for uh, some of the TSI. A lot of the stuff you saw, they have to boat to, you know, about a 30 minute boat ride either way. And so they have to rent a boat or bring their boats and all these kind of things. Those all affect the cost. Hand pile yeah. is about, a thousand to twelve hundred bucks an acre. <clears throat> and about how hard. much? How much man time, man or woman time, does it take to get through an acre um, of that TSI treatment on average? Do you know? Well, on average, you know, there's a lot of different crews, and some are incredibly productive, and some are incredibly not productive. You know, we just pay them by acre, so they they can do it. But you know, I'd say it's uh, averaging a half an acre a person a day for a TSI for hand cut and pile, it's down to a 10th a day, 10th to a quarter. Because when then, you're piling, you're making piles. So you have to touch it a lot more. So every right. time you have to touch the wood, it costs more. <clears throat> exactly. Um, a, something that was brought up in your video, you talked about spotting. Um, can you explain what you mean by that term spotting? Spotting is when a fire spreads, not by a flame front moving forward, consuming, crunching through the available fuels. It's when a tree torches or some kind of fuel torches and the wind lifts those embers up, carries them out a ways and deposits them back down in uh, ready available fuels out in front of it. And then that starts a fire and it pulls in to the main fire. And that's how our fires generally, our gobblers, our big fires grow. They're spotting balsam and birch bark. And some of these things can carry for up to a couple miles. 
the lichens that come out of a dead uh, balsam. They catch on fire, they carry up, they smolder for a while in the smoke. There isn't enough oxygen maybe for them to keep burning. And they get up where there's fresh oxygen, they start again, and then they land out in front of the fire or to the sides and start a new fire, which grows and then gets pulled into the main fire. I'm gonna switch over to um, Lane. There was a question about um, whether or not there's a single source of information that shows the areas of known fires in the Arrowhead region. And maybe Timo, you, you know this too, but thinking Lang with his fire history background may have an answer for that. Yeah, Yeah, Rich, I, I asked a clarifying question about if you're referring to currently active fires or, or modern fires or historical fires. Um, I think the simplest answer is, is no, there isn't one simple, a single source. Um, but if you wanted to get more information about a specific event, um, let me know, I'd be happy to provide more information or get you connected to some sources. All right, and then Jack asked, um, Timo, what are your top two to three barriers to getting large acreage prescribed fires done every few years? The risk associated is uh, a big barrier. Someone has to take the risk. Someone has to be um, liable if things go wrong and be willing to be sued and held accountable. And uh, so that's myself and the line officers, the rangers. And so getting people to you know, be ready to do that because if anything goes wrong and this is more of a art than a science, I mean, it's both, but it's, we're learning always and things happen. We get forecasts all the time that are completely wrong. And we base all of our future actions off current forecasts. So, you know, think about that. Um, the other thing is um, money. Money can be a problem funding, the timing of the funding. We'll have money, but it might not be available on the days we can burn or at the times of the year. And uh, because we're having fires out west right now in California, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, that can affect burning here. And that's risk and money. And um, just getting things done, getting the buy-off from the communities is also a lot of work. We're, we're making some headway, but there's a lot of differing opinions on what's right, what looks good, what's appropriate. And some people, you know, can, can slow things down or stop things. And so that's from my, my history, it's the risk and the cost. And then just, uh, I don't know what you wanna call it, the feedback. Those are the three. <clears throat> Excellent. Uh, maybe toss this one over to you, Lane. Talked a lot about protection of life and property for fire, especially in Timo's presentation. But Lane, you talked about other ecosystem services that, that prescribed fire um, brings us, whether it be wildlife, diversity, uh, wildlife production, carbon sequestration even. So have any of those ecosystem services really been quantified to help support the use of prescribed fire? Yeah, that's a, a pretty involved question. Um, certainly there's uh, different disciplines looking into, uh, you know, the benefits of the investment in prescribed fire in certain, you know, as it relates to um, wildlife habitat or uh, carbon sequestration. Um, I'd say particularly out west, there's just been a lot of interest in thinking about um, prescribed fire in fire prone watersheds and basically thinking about um, forested watersheds as um, water towers essentially for communities that live downstream and that if you are doing active management in those systems to reduce the likelihood of catastrophic fire um, in those watersheds, you are, um, uh, you know, having um, millions of dollars in impact 
in basically a risk reduction or by, by removing the high probability of those um, systems failing and having losing water sources that are necessary in places like uh, the Southwest or the Intermountain West. Um, so yeah, there's organizations like the Nature Conservancy that are pretty involved with that. And I'd be happy to pass on more information if you're interested in, in that, Doug. Great, and then uh, Lane, another question. With all of this fire history research that's been done, um, can that really direct maybe future management at all? Do you see that impacting future management? Yeah, I'd like to think that um, these fire history records aren't just kind of historical curiosities, but they're data that can be applied directly to management. Uh, I think a big part of developing ensuring fire history records is just about the act of, of remembering or reminding people um, <laughs> what, uh, what these systems really developed in uh, historically and, and to be reminded that fire is an important part of these systems even if we haven't experienced it over our, our lifetimes. Um, I also think that we can pull quantifiable metrics from triggering based fire history records related to uh, fire frequency, um, you know, the age of stands when fire is first burns through them, um, fire seasonality, and other things related to fire, historical fire effects that we can basically fold into thinking about how to more effectively manage our fire dependent systems in the in the future moving forward basically um yeah doing restoration for uh, preparing for an uncertain future i'd like to say you know though uh we want to get to the ecosystem management the one thing with 100 years of uh suppression is um the first burn to get back to that is is really tough the first two are pretty tough um you kill people and we do have killed firefighters in public with uh, prescribed fires that have gotten away and, and things like that. And the loss of property and that is, there's just not an, any acceptance for that right now. And um, so it, scientifically it makes sense. Risk wise, it's very hard to do it. Like I said, um, there aren't many peers. I have very few peers that are burning right next to a private piece of ground in this nation. We talk a lot about it, but you lose a lot of sleep. And that's where the public's gonna have to really come in and partner with us, the agencies and the people willing to do it. And hopefully at some point start doing it on their own property. But uh, the risk is, uh, is pretty great to get it started again, you know? All right, we are at 730. So I just want to be mindful of everyone's time. I'm pretty sure Timo and Lane and Gloria are going to be willing to hang on for a few more minutes to answer some of these last few questions. But I did just kind of want to wrap us up for the evening for those of you that do need to jump off. Um, thank you very much for participating tonight. And thanks again to uh, both the US Forest Service and Lane Johnson from the Cloquet Forestry Center for everything they did to help support um, putting on this workshop this evening. Hopefully sometime soon we'll be able to do this in the woods again. Um, but know that there will be a recording of this presentation made available um, later this week or if not by the beginning of next week and that will be free and available to share to everyone. Um, but uh, with that, I would love to follow up with a couple more questions, Lane and Timo, if you guys are okay. All right, so feel free to jump, jump off if you need to, but if not, um, hang on for a little bit longer and we will uh, get through some more of these questions. Um, so one question from Nick is talking about fires and other ecological systems. So kind of getting out of our, our forest that we've been in in the, in the um, arrowhead, looking at maybe the mesic hardwoods or forested peatlands, probably fires would have occurred less frequently, but still played important roles. And so is there any thoughts there on human involvement in those systems, either historical or present? Well, I think uh, researchers and people out looking like uh, Lane and his peers are really helping us 
figure some of these things out so that as practitioners, we can go forward with better uh, prescriptions, a better idea, and then we can always have a feedback loop where we're seeing, um, you know, what the, uh, the outcomes were. We're guessing. We go out, we always got to look at what things look like, you know, and we got to keep doing it and um, we'll figure it out. Um, but, you know, the Messick thing, what you're talking about, uh, Messick hardwoods, well, um, maybe they were on a larger rotation and depends on the area and what the locals wanted and our peatlands, you know, where the, where the fires, uh, the re, um, what helped create our potholes for our duck and waterfowl populations. I mean, there's just so much research and so many great questions and for people to be able to go and look at them and, and do what Lane and his peers are doing. And, and we do it to a certain degree in the forest service. We have a lot of monitoring in that also, but um, I think it's, it's a, a new and growing field that's uh, really exciting. Yeah, Nick, add, adding to that uh, response from Timo, uh, I've heard some stories about uh, uh, maple stands in northern Minnesota being uh, lightly burned historically, basically keep them open, make it easier to, um, to tap them for sugar in the spring. Uh, that's something that maybe is practiced a little bit um, in, by some people in the Mille Lacs area still. Uh, I don't know if anyone else would back me up on that. And then also in peatland systems, there's some stories, at least on the Fond du Lac Reservation, about intentionally burning cranberry bogs to promote uh, the pro productivity of uh, cranberries for food. And so that could have certainly controlled um, or changed the ecology of, of black spruce and black spruce systems and some other um, lowland forest types. Uh, there's some fire history work happening uh, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan by Wisconsin DNR, Jed Mune and uh, his colleagues that are um, looking to reconstruct fire history records adjacent to peatlands. And so I think there's gonna be some interesting thing come interesting things coming out of that work that will kind of help inform um, how fire functioned in uh, wetter sites in the Great Lakes region. Um, another question popped up here and maybe Gloria, you wanna chime in and answer on this because of the work that you do as a firewise coordinator. Um, the question is what's being done to promote prescribed fire and its use as a tool we have a lot of materials developed for firewise. Is there anything like that being developed for prescribed fire? Ooh, good question. <laughs> um, that is something, at least in our region, that we are trying to develop. Um, but I would say in the Western states, um, there is quite a bit of information um, around prescribed fire. And um, we are in the process, and that's, again, why I emphasize our partnerships um, with Lane, with Timo, with the DNR, with tribal members on how do we get that information here, and how do we start talking um, to actually private landowners of thinking about using prescribed fire as a tool to help their promote the health of their forests. But right now, there's a lot of as Timo said, um, liability issues in doing that. Um, there's a lot of barriers, but we're hoping again through the education and looking at the historic past of prescribed burns that we can get this going, at least in our area. The, the other thing real quick about prescribed fire that we didn't touch on is uh, the difference between mechanical treatment by itself, like a logging treatment or a uh, fuels uh, treatment without fire and one with fire is we, Lane's whole thing and a lot of our is that we're in a fire dependent ecosystem and a lot of these ecosystems need fire at some time or another maybe every every couple of centuries maybe every couple of decades um, it depends you know but we have uh, biochar which is very important we have a hundred years where we don't have any biochar the other thing if you want to get rid of balsam when you cut it and disturb the soils with like a skitter or a piece of tool, it comes back thicker and more prolific than it did before. But balsam is very fire intolerant. 
So just a little fire kills it, but a fire broadcast fire, the kind of munches through the undergrowth kills most of the seed in the ground. With two burns, we're down to, you know, less than 10% of the balsam coming back that would, would have come back without a fire. So there's all these other things, the fire hardening of trees, the selection of certain species over another. When we just cut, we mainly get aspen and balsam back. When we burn, we get the long-lived conifer and birch and some of the other things, blueberry. And uh, so we do need to look at not just on government property, but on private property starting to use fire because fire is not just a tool, it's the tool that needs to be in there at least sometimes on all pieces of ground. And I just wanna sneak this in. There was a question about what percentage of prescribed fires escape versus are able to be contained. And someone did, Jack actually commented in here that probably 99% are successful with a very low incidence rate, maybe around 1% that escape from us that cause any damage. Would you guys um, kind of support that answer on that? I think it's 1.3 uh, okay. escape and what uh, what qualifies as an escape. I would get down to it's less than 1% or um, a real escape, but we're trying to get to where we're doing a, a hundred fires, a hundred prescribed burns across the Superior National Forest every three to four years. So, you know, there's the conundrum is are we willing to put up with a real escape every three to five years? <clears throat> That's so, the... I was just gonna say, speaking of conundrums, the last kind of real question we have in the chat, Paul, we got lots of comments and good, good kind of feedback for us tonight that we can go through. But the last question that I see is from Richard and he says, it sounds like a conundrum. <laughs> We need to reduce fuel loads, but risk issues make prescribed fires difficult and maybe main alternative mechanical manual treatments are expensive. Observations going forward. So this may be more philosophical on where do we go from here? Look at the West, it's burning. Uh, Napa Valley, Sonoma never used to have fires. I worked out there for a while in California. I wouldn't say never had fires, but things are drying out. Climate change is, uh, you know, a, a factor. We have, we have droughts, we have huge rainstorms, we have big wind events. Um, I think, I believe in prescribed fire, and bigger units of it, and as much as we can get done, because like I said in the video, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. So that's the real work that can be done. And, um, you know, these fires we're having are high severity. And high severity isn't the kind of fires as much that Lane was showing you in the past where we, we the, the folks were using it more. Ours are a, a lot more severe. So. It's, it's a society issue and we'll have to get the answers as a, as a group, you know. Richard, I'd say one thing that I find promising about being in the Lake States and having to deal with our fuel issues here is that we do have a viable um, pulp and timber industry. Um, and that oftentimes we can do uh, mechanical treatments that can pay for themselves or are profitable at some scale and we can take the money that's made on those timber sales and pump them back into um, doing stewardship work, uh, whether that's more fuels reduction in adjacent areas or um, actual uh, broadcast burning um, prescribed fire to get the effects that Timo was talking about earlier. That's something a little bit more long lasting so uh, here in the Lake States, I'm, I'm fairly hopeful that we can scale up and deal with this conundrum. Uh, we have a lot more flexibility than, um, than they do in the Southwest and other places where timber markets don't exist. And really it's just about um, finding the, the willpower and like societal buy-in for us to invest in this uh, at scales that are, are meaningful, um, both um, from like a fire risk standpoint, but also thinking about all the ecological benefits that could come 
uh, with, with it. Great. I think that's a good point to wrap up for tonight. Um, I know there's a few other comments that have come through in the chat pod and I have saved that so the speakers can address any additional questions that are coming in. But also just know that when the recording goes out to everyone, both Timo and Lane's contact information will be included. So if you want to follow up with any questions with them, um, please feel free to. Uh, likewise with Gloria as well, um, as uh, she's the one that coordinated this program tonight. So Gloria, do you have any last parting words before we sign off this evening? I just want to thank again so much for um, everyone who attended and specifically Lane and Timo for taking the time uh, to do this, but also just really appreciate the partnerships that we have and the collaboration working together on this. So thank you very, very much. And Ashley, wonderful job in the video. So we really <laughs> want to thank you being the camera person there and pulling it all together. <laughs> It was excellent. Thank you, Anne, Gloria, uh, Roach, and Selmer, and Lane. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> Have a good night. Yeah, thanks, everyone, for coming out this evening. Thanks.